Well, it's a beautiful day outside. The sun is out. Here, here I'll show you. Look at Isn't that... It's just gorgeous out there. I just love this weather in the Carolina. It's going into winter, and it's still sunny, and I'm very blessed. But uh, today I want to do a video, uh, get back to God's Word, and just kind of keep up on doing some of these uh, devotions and uh, studies. Today I opened up the book of Isaiah, and I'm going to read from it, and it's going to kind of just lay the groundwork. And then I'm going to read from a really powerful book that's by Helmut Habel. He's actually a, a German, and he's got two books out. This one is called Abide in Jesus. And so um, I don't think it's by accident we read out of that last night, because uh, this morning I opened up to Isaiah, and this is where I want to begin. So um, I started reading this. I, I, I think it's Isaiah 520 where it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. And, you know, I'm just going to start with this. We all know that we're living in a time when that is so true. It's, um, I, I call this the um, cancel culture. Uh, it is where you cannot even speak biblical truth anymore because there's such a delusion out there. And the unfortunate thing is we're seeing the delusion in our colleges, in our schools. One thing that I can really praise the Lord about that I just heard uh, that uh, Trump announced, uh, had a big announcement about education. He's taking the educational um, um, oversight from the government and putting it back into the hands, really, of the state, where it should have been all along. I saw my first video uh, from Oklahoma that said that, um, th I think the superintendent or the governor, whoever it is in Oklahoma, is reintroducing the Bible into the classroom. Now, I think that's wonderful because our country is a, is a Protestant country, and it was founded on biblical truth. Now, we also have freedom, and we have to be very cautious when we are crossing lines when the government gets involved in our religious freedom. We all have the right to um, to worship whoever, however, and we have to be very, very careful with thinking that um, this is this is really, really good, and it is. But we also have to be careful that we don't go way, way, way to to a, a pendulum swing where we are now infringing on people's rights to say, you know what, I'm Muslim and I have the right to be Muslim or I'm a Mormon. I have the right to be a Mormon. So it's good that we're introducing this back into the educational system. I like that. But we also have to remember God gave us freedom, religious freedom. And that comes from our founding fathers too. So very careful. But this cancel culture has got, we've swung the pendulum to the other side where evil is good and good is evil, you know, and, and that's what we've been seeing lately. And it's very confusing because our children are confused. Uh, they're being really, um, indoctrinated to hate the government, uh, to hate really, um, themselves because they think that they're a mistake. And it's really, really sad what we're seeing. So I won't continue reading uh, what else Isaiah um, says in uh, the rest of this um, um, five here, but uh, read it because um, it really does follow the lines of uh, the good and evil and what God is going to do to the wicked. It, it spells it out right here about the fire devouring the stubble, and um, it's it's very, very powerful. Uh, but then it goes over here to Isaiah um, called to be a prophet. And um, I want you to, I want to, I want to go over here and read a little bit of this also. It's real quick. We go to Isaiah 6 and he says, In the year uh, that King Azua died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up with the train of his robe filled the temple. This is really a beautiful, beautiful vision. Above it stood a seraphim. Each one had six wings and two he covered his face and two he covered his feet and with two he flew. And one cried to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then, and now look at what, what he says here. Isaiah says, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. Can you believe that? Here is Isaiah, a man of God, who is before a holy God, recognizing that 
he, he, he just crumbles because he's like, I, I'm not worthy to be here. And he's a man of God. That's how pure and holy God is to be in his presence. And, 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 you know, we could say that Isaiah was, man, he was the guy. He was God's guy. But even in the, in, in, in the, the presence of the Lord, he became undone. And then listen to this. The one of the seraphims flew to me having in his hand, look, listen to this, a live coal which he had taken from the throngs of the altar. Think about this. It's a live coal. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. That live coal, that taking away of our sins. It is amazing that he didn't bring that live coal and touch our heart. He didn't bring the live coal and touch his brain. He touched his lips. Because whatever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And so this is a little, little tool that can do so much damage. And so this is where God started with the prophet. And he brought that live coal and he touched his lips. And then um, the voice of the Lord said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I love that because God is, God is calling and saying, who, you know, stand, it's like an altar call. And what does Isaiah said? Then I said, here I am, send me. That's my scripture. <laughs> I get a little teary eyed because um, I'm the one who raised their hands and when I raised my hand and said, here I am, send me, my life changed. My life changed. And I am a woman of unclean lips. But I tell you what, that hot coal does a work. And I want to read this real quick. It says here, we each have our work. And this is really beautiful. It says to everyone who becomes a partaker, listen to this, that, that's you if you're listening and you're a believer, everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. Individually, we are to stand our lot in place saying, here am I, send me. Upon the minister, the word, the missionary nurse, the Christian physician, the individual Christian, whether it be a merchant or a farmer, a professional man or a mechanic, the responsibility rests upon all. I think there are a lot of awesome people out there who go to church or maybe they, they worship at home and they listen online to uh, services and, and I they're in the word and they're trying to live a good life. But one of the biggest things, and this is throughout this word, is we are called to be disciples. We are called to raise our hands. We are called to go up to the altar. It's so important to remember that because we go back to woe to those who call evil good and good evil. How are those people ever going to hear the message and know? Because what they face is fire. They, I mean, they are facing death. The wages of sin is death. They're going to be punished and then they will be no more. They're going to be snuffed out like snu a stubble. We know people right now. I know you know people that either don't know the Lord or know the Lord and are just so, you know, they're doing their own thing. No fear. No, I mean, just, and, and their hearts get hardened and they get deceived. I, I want to read this. This is a good lead in here. Hang on. Okay. Now this is a good lead in from Isaiah to, to this book. 
because now hopefully this is going to clarify a little bit about um, obedience to God's principles and what I was just talking about, the people who are confused, the people who are rejecting God, um, the carnal Christians who go to church and, you know, out of both sides of their mouth, they're talking. I mean, what's, what's going on here? And, you know, good for evil and evil for good. Now, listen to this. I want to, re- I want to read this. It says here, confusion regarding obedience to God's principles. Listen to this. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 3 and 4, If our gospel be hid, hmm, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, which believe not. Least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. So this is who I'm talking about. Satan blinds and disguises. You know, remember, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against the principalities. Who is that? That's Satan and his, his minions. A blinded man can imply two things. Now listen to this. First, that certain things aren't even seen. So that certain things are disguised or hidden. Second, it can mean a mind that is charmed that sees wrong points of view as right. What did we just read, right? Call evil good and good evil. And look at what this book is saying. We don't realize how cleverly these ideas are foisted on us. This disguising and blinding prevents the right view. The text says that this happens to non-believers, but... We make the shocking discovering that the same thing happens to carnal Christians. They profess Jesus, but have not completely surrendered themselves to him. That's why the God of this world can blind them. Listen to this. Because this is from Matthew 24, 24. I am convinced that Satan attempts this blinding with spiritual Christians as well. This guy is right. Because I've seen it. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24, if... It were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. John 5.18 says, according to the German Luther version, he who is born of God preserves him and evil does not touch him. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leaving the professed churches are leavening, I'm sorry, are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus clearly describes this phenomenon in his message in the Laodicean in Revelation 3.17. I'm going to end it right there because I, this could be a very long, long video. But you see how powerful that is? We have to really, really, really look at ourselves. We really have to be careful. We really have to walk in obedience. We really have to read God's word. We really should be raising our hands saying, here I am, Lord, send me. And and it's because we have a world out there that is dying. Yes, there are carnal Christians. And and if you're a churchgoer, you, you all probably already know some of those carnal Christians. I know some carnal Christians. <laughs> and uh, I even have... Um, a certain family member that has told me I'm a carnal Christian. She recognizes that she's a carnal Christian and she's striving to walk more with the Lord. She's studying more. She's praying more. Uh, she's trying to walk more in obedience and, and, and she loves the Lord. So it's, it's not bad when you get to that place and you recognize like, oh man, that's me. Now what do I do? Well, there's hope. There's hope. You know, God is so merciful and so for grace. He wants us with us. You know, he's not going to leave anybody out. So when I read these things, uh, you know, this is, this is the bottom line. There is hope in these pages. There is hope through the power of the blood of the Lamb of God. Uh, and that's for everybody. There is no person out there that is so bad, so lost, that God would say, no, you, you're not coming in. You know, I thought I was one of them. I really did. I thought I was one of them. And um took me a long time. Probably I'd say a good three years before I realized that that blood covered me too. That 
it was powerful enough to cover my sins. And with great humility and at the, at the foot of the cross, it started changing me. And it also gave me relief that I could leave my past behind. And I didn't have to wear that scarlet letter. I didn't have to carry that bag of sins with me and things that I had done wrong. And I didn't have to listen to back there, all the people who didn't forgive me or who lied and tried to destroy my character, whatever their deal was back there. Poof. They had no more power over me. Zero. So no matter what anybody said on Facebook about me, whatever anybody said on YouTube about me, no matter how many terrible posts, no matter who, who no matter what, no matter what family member did what and said what about me, what whatever lies and distortions, I didn't care anymore. They couldn't use my past against me anymore. They couldn't use anything against me because now I am a daughter of the most high. Poof, untouchable. And that's what happens when you become a son or daughter of God. Now, there's a work. You have to walk in obedience. Sometimes we backslide. We got to repent, go back to the foot of the cross, kind of start over. It's a work in progress. But when we sign up, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. But works is, a, is, is, is evidence of our faith. So, we got a job to do. You don't sign up for a marriage and then go sit on the couch. There's work to do in a marriage, right? That is evidence that you're married. You want to take care of your wife. You want to take care of your husband. You want to do things for him. Well, same thing when you marry Jesus. And we've got a dying world out there that needs to hear the hope that is in us. Okay, now I'm preaching. <laughs> Sorry about that. But okay, I'm going to get this all tied together and um, let's talk. And I'd love to hear your comments. I hope you're having a great day. And I hope this encouraged somebody. I know somebody out there needed this today. God always arranges that. You know that, right? All right. God bless.